When it's time to eat, the fish in this tank quite simply crush it. A feeding frenzy. The tank is about the unlikeliest place you'd expect to find this fish, a marine species called cobia. They are native to places around the world, from Australia to India and throughout the Caribbean and coastal waters of the southern United States. But home for these guys and gals is the University of Miami's Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. And this area here is totally gone. Yes. The Cobia R, says Dr. Daniel Bonetti, part of the ongoing research here, aimed at satisfying through aquaculture the world's growing demand for healthy seafood. Aquaculture is breeding, raising, and harvesting fish and shellfish. Basically, it's fish farming. Every generation, they become a little shorter and a little fatter, fatter just like a football. Whereas in the, in the wild, the original uh, cobia, for example, is like very streamlined. Yeah. So they're not very efficient for aquaculture, so to speak. But if you look at ours, they are like more like a football. So they are fat yeah. and thick and strong yeah. and short and with a higher fillet yield. But higher when fillet I, yield. A higher fillet yield, yeah, exactly. The university's work is focused primarily on developing environmentally sustainable and economically viable techniques to raise marine species like red snapper, hogfish, grouper, southern flounder, and the cobia, none of which historically have been easy to raise or economically feasible for aquaculture. They are, says Miami researcher Dr. John Stieglitz, high-value species. For a number of the fish species here on site, we're developing that technology to spawn these fish in captivity, which means have them produce fertilized eggs, take those fertilized eggs and have them grow into juvenile fish and even up to market size fish to get this industry going here in the United States. So this is our larva culture facility. Um, this is where um, we basically make the babies. Uh, we bring the fertilized eggs in here and we can have um, as many as 16,000 larvae in, in one of these um, systems. In College Station, Texas, Texas A&M University professor Todd Sink is doing similar research. One of the primary marine species he works with is red drum. The advances in aquaculture have, Sink says, brought fish farming light years from the dark ages of the 1970s when farming catfish was as basic as it gets. Dig holes in the ground, fill them with water, add fish. Now we have high-tech monitoring systems, automated feed systems. Um, we're really producing a technology that's pushing the limits of where we can be. At both universities, there is a sense of urgency. According to the United Nations, the world's increasing population will need 110 billion more pounds of seafood by 2030, just seven years away. Some studies suggest the world's demand for animal protein will increase 52% as the population approaches 10 billion by 2050. Aquaculture is producing more than 100 million tons of seafood annually. Wild caught fish and shrimp have been holding steady at about 85 million tons. It's pretty much reached its limit. The oceans are simply not able to sustain the overwhelming demand for seafood. Aquaculture is not just about producing fish for human consumption and for making a buck. It is about conservation of the species as well. For example, some species such as salmon and shrimp at the current levels of consumption would have been extinct if it weren't for aquaculture. We produce more aquaculture than we do beef in the world. We produce more fish than from all the world's oceans. Um, when you look at animal production trends, really uh, poultry, chickens, and fish, aquaculture are the only ones on the uprise. In fact, the United Nations reports that from 1990 to 2018, aquaculture production was up 527%, with much of the supply coming from fish and shrimp farms in Asia. What might surprise you, perhaps shock you, is that overall, the U.S. imports more than 65% of seafood, creating a $17 billion trade deficit. 
90% of all the shrimp consumed in the U.S. is imported. The next time you're at the supermarket, check the label on that package of seafood. The United States Department of Agriculture requires that seafood, whether it's at a restaurant like this or at the supermarket, has to be labeled whether it's wild caught, farm raised, and the country of origin. For example, this is a box of salmon. It's a farm raised product from Chile. And this is a box of mahi mahi. And this is wild caught and a product of Ecuador. We all want to have our fish, have that farm to table movement succeed here in the US. But the fact is, most of the farm raised seafood is produced overseas. So how is that possible? Why is the US so reliant on others for seafood? It's pretty much what you'd think. Labor and production costs are cheaper overseas, and there are so many regulatory hurdles, it scares away potential farming operations unless they have very deep pockets. Here in Texas, aquaculture is regulated by six different state agencies. Whereas, you know, if you were growing soybeans, you're really regulated by the Texas Department of Agriculture, one agency. A couple of years ago, Texas legalized the production of oysters in state waters. But Sink says there are more than a dozen levels of permitting to get site approval before you can purchase a lease from the state. Also, on top of that, the state collects $2,000 per acre a year in lease fees in order to use state resources. So you may be talking tens or twenties of thousands of dollars per acre by the time this whole thing, before you ever get to put in the first culture cage. And so you may be deeply in debt for the next 20 years working off these fees and regulations. Many of which like water quality and land use are in place to protect the environment. So the fact is researchers say fish farmers are benefiting from the advanced aquaculture technology and science that's being developed in the US. Most of them just aren't in the U.S. The University of Miami has been providing genetic material from its Cobia breeding program to Open Blue Sea Farms, a hugely successful commercial operation off the coast of Panama. There's a huge potential for jobs here in the U.S. and in the Southeast region in particular within aquaculture, but we need the farms. So right now we're ahead of the industry in terms of we have the seed stock availability, but the farms don't exist where we can send these commercial quantities of fingerling fish. And there are no takers. There's no market. There is no takers to raise them. The, the, the people are not ready. Like the snapper. Well, like the snapper. We produced like uh, last year 30,000 juveniles yeah. selected. We basically could not give away the fish. Scientists say one of the greatest advances in aquaculture has been getting these species like snapper and cobia to spawn in captivity. One female cobia can produce a million or more eggs every time she spawns. At the University of Miami, the survival rate is about 20% or 200,000 eggs. Folks may say, oh, that doesn't seem like that's that high of a number. But when you compare it to survival in the wild, right, from a million egg spawn. In the wild, only one or two of those individuals would likely make it through to adulthood. One or two out of a million? Right, would recruit. So we talk about recruitment. And why is that? Is it because they eat their own and everything else? Right, it's a dog-eat-dog it's -dog world out there in the ocean. And so uh, it's a scenario where a lot of times those early life stages are actually food for other species. We have one, one female cobia that we got four million eggs in one spawn from. Well, that, that sounds really good, but she spawns every 12 days for three months. So one, one cobia female can supply an entire aquaculture operation when done it right, whereas in the wild, maybe one or two of her offspring would make it a year. The story is the same for shrimp. Again, nearly all of it, 1.8 billion pounds a year is imported into the U.S. simply because farms don't exist. So I've got Mauricio here. Mauricio, grab us one of these shrimp out of here. Now these shrimp, it took 150 days to get to this size. What you'll notice though, when he grabs it out, is that they are huge, about 50 grams. Yeah, 50 grams. But what you will not see is this shrimp 
on your table because these shrimp are not for eating. They are for breeding. We'll get back to that. This is Inland Oceans in Felsmere, Florida. Historically, shrimp are raised in ponds where clean water is pumped in and dirty water pumped out into the environment pretty much on a daily basis. Here at Inland Oceans, shrimp are raised inside a greenhouse in what are called raceways. That's where we're going in? That's where we're going in. Leslie Knusen is one of the company founders. And so what makes the water clean all the time? It's the bacteria in the water. In the water. So this system is mixing and, 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 and causing turbulence so that the solids in the water don't settle on the bottom. They'll go toxic. So it's flowing anti-clockwise. You can see it's moving yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's doing this. So the solids are there, never get a chance to settle in the bottom. This is a male. The technology is called BioFlock. Bottom line, it prevents diseases from incoming water, provides nutrition, and produces healthier, hardier shrimp. Well, we use a system that really mimics nature itself. So we try and recreate what those shrimp, the environment they would be in, and we create what I call a shrimptopia, um, an environment which is uh, self-cleaning um, through the bacteria that you find in nature. We're using mixotrophic bioflock. Right and we're able to grow these shrimp inland, away from the ocean, using far less energy and zero water exchange, which changes the economics of growing the shrimp and also enables them to be grown in places where you couldn't grow shrimp using traditional methods of open pond farming. Each of these raceways can hold up to 50,000 shrimp. Both Knusen and Ray say the ability to grow shrimp inland in more compact facilities should allow for smaller scale operations to be successful in the U.S. So back to these shrimp. Because they grow quickly, have a high survival rate and resistance to disease, they are prized as breeders or broodstock. Once mature, they will be sent on their way to farms in Asia. When they're sent over to fish farms. Where do, where, do, where do yours go? They go to uh, Thailand, China, Vietnam, Singapore, Indonesia mostly, mostly Southeast Asia. And out of these, the broodstock that go there, tell us how many, how many shrimp can you ultimately get? You know, and how many does, it, does a, a female shrimp produce? Well, if it's a mature female, she can produce between 300 to 500,000 eggs. Every time she spawns? Every time she spawns, and she can spawn sometimes three times a month. Researchers believe with the technology at hand to farm more seafood and add new species to the mix, meeting the United Nations projection of 110 billion pounds more seafood by 2030 is not out of the question. I think we're gonna close that gap. I think we're gonna get really close. But just how close may depend on whether that sense of urgency the researchers see catches on with the rest of the planet.